Welcome everyone to our EAI Expedition Seminar. And today I'm going to introduce um, one of our core EAI faculty, uh, Professor Matthew Goodwin. He is an interdisciplinary professor who is jointly appointed at Bouvet of College of Health Sciences and Corey College of Computer Science. He is a founding member of a new doctoral program in personal health informatics and directs the computational behavioral science lab. He also held, he used to hold appointments at Harvard Medical School, at Brown University, at MIT Media Lab as clin director of clinical research. And he has also had a lot of service roles, including executive board of the International Society for Autism, the scientific advisory board for Autism Speaks, and he has over 25 years of research and clinical experience working with children and adults on autism. And he has won several awards as well. He has including dissertation award from the Society of Multivariate Experimental Psychology, uh, Peter Miranda Prize in Stats and Research Methodology, Hariri Award for Transformative Computational Science, and you can see there's many, many awards of different kinds, including, um, including Princeton Autism Lecture Series, Aspen Idea Scholar for the Aspen Institute, um, and so on. <laughs> and and um, he has won also several grants from, from DARPA, from Nancy Lurie Marks Family Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, National Institute on Disability and Independent Living, NIH, NSF, and Simmons Foundation. And, um, and with that, I, I give you Matt Goodwin. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, looks like we have a quick plug uh, for EAI, um, which researches and develops human-centric AI solutions that leverage machine technology and extend human intelligence. Um, I very much resonate with this mission, and I hope that the presentation today exemplifies some of the diverse and impactful work that our core faculty and affiliated faculty are doing in the Institute. So this is uh, going to be a relatively quick, but I'm trying to fit a lot in. Um, if I go too fast and you have questions, please jot them down and we'll revisit them at the end. But this will be uh, work over the last about seven years exploring wearable biosensing and machine learning to see if we can predict imminent aggressive behavior in psychiatric inpatient youth with autism. So there have been um, some recent surveys that suggest that as many as two thirds of youth with autism engage in aggressive behavior. This tends to be aggression to other people, self-injury, property destruction, and elopement, which is sort of getting up and fleeing without notice. Um, these are one of the primary reasons that this population gets referred to behavioral health care services. When an individual engages in these aggressive behaviors, it presents an imminent safety risk for them and for others in the environment. So families often report that aggression in their child increases also their stress as um, isolation and financial burden, and it decreases available support options. They're afraid to go out into the community or afraid to put their child into public settings for fear that they may erupt in these aggressive behaviors. This also has collateral um, challenges for that family when they're at home with their child who may be very aggressive. We saw this very acutely during the pandemic where the siblings and the environment is uh, getting sort of torn apart. And then we know from uh, studies that this these family systems tend to have higher divorce rates, higher substance uh, abuse, and it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a system effect that is much broader than, than just that individual. The families also have higher 911 calls, higher emergency room visits, and often um, more lengthy psychiatric inpatient stay for their children. And you have to remember that these are acute 
crisis services. These are not um, long-term services for, for chronic support. We also know from the literature that professional support staff um, experience greater injuries, higher insurance claims, and more burnout as a result of uh, working with individuals who engage in aggressive behavior. So you can see that this kind of difficult situation collectively increases the morbidity, mortality, and then ultimately demoralization. Uh, the families themselves, care providers, and communities feel like they're powerless uh, to, to affect the situation. This kind of aggressive behavior is especially impairing and refractory to intervention in the 30 to 40% of autistic, autistic youth who are non-speaking and have relatively fat, flat affect. So their inability to self-report can lead to behaviors that seem to occur out of nowhere, out of the blue. So I'd like to play a short video of a mother of a daughter with autism who engages in aggressive behavior. She's also the founder of the Autism Science Foundation. Jody is 26 years old. She is diagnosed with profound autism. She is sweet. She is affectionate. She has the purest soul. And she has serious episodes of self-injury and aggression. 27% of people who are diagnosed autism spectrum disorder meet the clinical definition of profound autism. It's defined as people who have autism who also have IQ below 50, who are nonverbal or minimally verbal, and who require 24-7 supervision in order to maintain safety. The biggest issue that families of kids with profound autism describe is really the self-injurious and aggressive behavior. There is nothing harder than watching your child hurt him or herself. Children will bang their heads against the floor with such ferocity that they experience detached retinas. They scratch, they bite. Some of these behaviors make it impossible to go out and participate in community activities. So for that reason, a lot of families stay home. They become very socially isolated. Often before these incidents take place, there's no warning to parents. There's no outward sign that you can visibly see that something is going to happen. One incident that really sticks out in my mind is when Jody was five years old and her sister was three years old. I was driving our minivan. Jody wanted to go back home, but we had to stop and do an errand. So when she saw that the car was not proceeding in the route that she knew to be towards home, she managed to unbuckle herself and came at me, started hitting me and punching me and screaming. I sort of pushed her off me. She started going after her sister. It was the most dangerous situation I think I've ever been in in my life with my two children in the car. It's hard for me as a mother when my child is hitting me, but it's, it's, it's worse when she hits my other daughter, especially a help, you know, when she's helpless, strapped in a car seat. So that was, that's one I don't really love to think about too much, but that was, that was, That's why the biosensor research that Matthew is doing is critical. If I had some warning that Jody was about to have an aggressive outburst, I could have pulled my car over. I would have tended to her. I would have made sure that we were all safe. If we had that additional tool, I think I would be a little bit more relaxed. I wouldn't feel like I had to know everything about every environment before I took her. Because I would know if the invisible stress were starting, I would be able to intervene. Most of the research that's being done in autism right now is being done on individuals who are able to get themselves to universities to participate. This type of research can be done in their own community. It can be done in their school. It can be done in their home. It's a way to bring the research into the community as opposed to bringing people with autism to the university. These are not bad kids. They're not acting out because they're bad or they're mean. It's part of their autism. What the data from the biosensor allows an adult to do is to intervene compassionately. 
when someone intervenes, you're helping them to regain their control and be better able to participate in community activities. It really has huge potential to improve the lives of people with profound autism. So for those of you um, who might be new to this area, the most recent um, Center for Disease Control surveillance of the prevalence of autism is suggesting that one in 36 children by the age of eight meet criteria. This represents 2.7% of the general population or 78 million people worldwide. Of those 78 million diagnosed, 27% um, or 21 million people meet criteria for profound autism. And from the surveys we have now, about 80% of those individuals engage in aggressive behavior. So the potential um, benefit of some of this work could extend to 17 billion people worldwide. In 2021, a little more stage setting for you, uh, an international team of leading advocates and uh, researchers and nonprofit foundations published uh, this Lancet Commission on the Future Care of Clinical Research in Autism. And I just want to read, uh, this is an excerpt, this isn't all of their guidance, but I think that these are germane to this topic. Of those 78 million with autism diagnosed now, the majority do not receive support from or have access to adequate health care, education, and social care services. Children and adults with autism can have happy and healthy lives, but urgent action is required to promote these outcomes. Autism is heterogeneous, meaning there's a wide individual differences, and it requires personalized evidence-based assessments and interventions that are accessible and affordable to every person and that can improve the lives of individuals and their families. A stepped care and personalized health approach to delivering services and monitoring effectiveness across time provides a framework for efficient and equitable distribution of resources to improve outcomes and research that will result in immediate improvements in the lives of people with autism and their families should be prioritized. And I wanna underscore that these issues are particularly salient for those on the autism spectrum who are non-white, who experience lower social economic status, who live in rural settings and have higher support needs. All of those factors preclude their participation in research and then the benefits thereof. So traditionally aggressive behavior in autism, I'd say over the last 50 to maybe 70 years, was conceptualized as escaping or avoiding demands as oppositional or defiant behavior or forensic, meaning there's some pleasure that's being taken out of harming other people. An alternative conceptualization is that these behaviors are maladaptive attempts to communicate or modulate physiological arousal due to distress. So think of these as fight or flight responses instead of oppositional or defiant, where an individual is trying to regain homeostatic equilibrium. There is emerging literature that suggests that there are several factors that are related to autism that can impair emotion regulation, that either singly or in combination could lead to aggressive behavior. So this is limited emotional language or alexithymia, the, the difficulty identifying an internal state and communicating it to another, having poor flexibility or cognitive rigidity, um, liking routines, having lower inhibition, so being able to sort of stop uh, an urge that you have, poor problem solving and abstract reasoning, difficulty reading social and emotional cues from other people, having sensitivity to changes in, in your routine or environmental stimulation, and then biological predispositions related to physiological arousal, neural circuitry, or genetics. So the present work, uh, we're operating under this conceptual framework that these behaviors are related to fight or flight responses. We're gonna take a, a more simplistic view of a long, uh, evolutionary phylogenetically conserved down to the reptiles, if you are in the face of something that may be a risk to your survival, you will confront that or you will flee that. 
In typical youth, we know that the greater ability to regulate physiological arousal is associated with fewer behavioral problems. We know that studies of disorders characterized by emotional and behavioral dysregulation, like bipolar disorder or antisocial behavior, have strong associations with physiological arousal and symptomology. We also have data that prior research in autism demonstrates that individuals who engage in aggressive behaviors um, attempting to communicate or to alleviate distress is associated with increased arousal and then a decrease in arousal when they are in a situation where they feel like they're not having demands placed on them again. But if these behaviors are punished or the um, fighting or fleeing does not address the underlying distress that they're experiencing, they can engage or keep experiencing increased physiological arousal, which exacerbates and perpetuates this loop of distress, arousal, and aggression. Some of the central nervous system, and then we'll get to the peripheral, and then I'll tell you what we measured, and then we'll really get into what the data um, that we gathered. This is somewhat long and somewhat complex, but what this is showing us is that the stress response begins with an appraisal of an actual or perceived threat from the um, frontal cortex. So what stresses me may not stress you, but when we experience that appraisal, that essentially we're gonna need to adjust our behavior to manage that stress, we get very rapid limbic system activation with the amygdala, threat detection, the hippocampus, memory for um, salient events. This will trigger, trigger hormones like corticotropin releasing hormones and norepinephrine that send a signal down the brainstem to the adrenal glands on the top of the kidneys. This will stimulate the peripheral nervous system. I'll talk about that in a subsequent slide. That is now preparing our body muscle um, and, and organ, especially heart tissue, to now prepare for activation in order to flee or in order to um, confront. If these systems stay on for long periods of time, we get um, engagement of locus coralius and it restarts the amygdala, hippocampus, and um, uh, glucocorticoid um, cascade. Those systems were meant to be on for short periods of time to evade threat. They were not meant to be on for long periods of time. And if those hormones are circulating in your brain over extended period of times, it can kill nerves, cells in your amygdala and your hippocampus, which makes you less able to discriminate novelty from threat. So once we're, we're um, brain is uncertain or is confronted something that didn't go well in the past, and the autonomic nervous system is engaged, there are two branches, right? There's the sympathetic nervous system. Think of this as the accelerator in a car. There's the parasympathetic. You can think of that as the brake. Both of these branches of the peripheral nervous system are what are, are essentially gating for our pupils, taking more visual uh, information, it's affecting salivation, it's affecting how fast our heart beats, it affects how fast uh, we're breathing, it affects our digestion, it affects our sweating, it affects our um, digestive and reproductive function. So under distress, we have increased sympathetic tone, and that is what is enabling us to, to prepare. Um, after the stressor is passed, parasympathetic is more dominant, and that is recovering and repairing from any damage that was done um, when you were in that extreme sympathetic state. So our hypothesis that guides this work and our objective is that physiological arousal precedes aggressive behavior. We're gonna focus on aggression to other people, self-injury and major tantrums and meltdowns. And our objective is to test whether the proximal onset of an aggressive behavior can be predicted from preceding physiological signals using um, wearable biosensing and machine learning. The study was done in four psychiatric inpatient sites around the country. This is a subset of sites that are supported by the Simons Foundation um, Autism Research Initiative, where so the less verbally able, the more cognitively impaired, the more medically complex, the higher rates of these aggressive behaviors. That segment of the population is understudied 
and underserved in our literature and our clinical practices, in part because it's very difficult population to get to comply with university-based research, which is essentially strange places with strange people doing tasks you've never done before for ill-defined periods of time and being able to cope well enough that you can contribute your data. So instead of bringing individuals to the lab, a large group of us thought, let's take the lab to individuals, let's go to settings where they're coming in routinely for clinical care, and they're getting all sorts of um, neuropsych assessments, they're getting blood draws and genetics, they can have options to engage in brain scans. This was also, I thought, a nice high throughput area to be able to gather novel information, novel data, um, where it's staffed 24 seven. These kids are engaging in behaviors that can be of harm to themselves or other people. And so uh, you want them to be supported and intervened with, to keep them and other people safe. Um, so this is Spring Harbor Hospital in Portland, Maine, Bradley Hospital in Providence from Psychiatric Institute in um, Pittsburgh, and then Cincinnati Children's Hospital. 70 individuals um, were participating in the study that we were able to get biosensor data and behavioral annotation, which I'll tell you both about in a moment. Um, and they're, these are 9 to 15-year-old. They're predominantly male. More than half are minimally verbal or non-speaking um, and um, have moderate to significantly below average uh, IQ. The length of their hospital stays ranged from about 8 to 200 days. The physiological data that we're recording is from a wearable biosensor. This is a commercially available device produced by uh, Empatica. It's called the E4. It's recording um, cardiovascular measures, blood volume pulse using photoplasmography optics um, that we can derive heart rate and heart rate variability, which is the distance between beats in addition to um, how, how fast the heart is beating. It also records electrodermal activity. So that's the measure of sweat on the surface of the skin. It records three axis accelerometry. So we know something about motor activity and um, postural changes and, and physical actions. And then um, skin surface temperature through thermopile. The clock in the sensor was synchronized with an app that we custom built on a phone where the clinical staff can identify for us the onset and the offset of naturally emitted. We're not eliciting any of these behaviors. They're not provoking them and they're intervening as they normally would. Um, whether the individual aggressed to another person, aggressed to themselves, or had a, a major meltdown, which we called emotion dysregulation in this case. 20% of this data was dual coded by two people. So we could check for iterator reliability and we achieved 80% and above um, for all of our data. So this is essentially our ground truth label of when did these events occur, onset and offset, and in what sequence. We had 429 data collection sessions that uh, accumulated 497 hours of data, of which we had 2,063 tantrums or meltdowns with accompanying biosensor data, 3,983 self-injurious behaviors, and 6,000, sorry, I missed something. Yeah, okay, for a total of 6,665 aggressive behaviors available for machine learning. Okay, 500 hours over 6,000 instances of naturally occurring across these 70 individuals. We saw more self-injurious behavior. We saw about comparable levels of self-injurious behavior and emotion dysregulation. So we had done a previous study at one inpatient site with 20 individuals and just looking at aggression. And we found that rich regularized logistic regression enabled us to make a prediction one minute in advance with uh, 0.71 area under the curve for person dependent uh, uh, population models and 0.84 area under the curve for person dependent models. Whether you train on everybody and leave one out or you use sessions within a person, you train early and you test late. Um, the current results are extending that research by looking at four sites, 
expanding from just aggression to other to also include self-injury and emotion dysregulation. And because we have more data, we can look a little further into the future um, in, in these predictive models. Um, we use logistic regression, support vector machines, and neural networks. After normalizing the data through balancing and whitening, we use 15 second sliding windows and we're looking up to three minutes into the past and how well that is predictive of up to three minutes into the future. And for some of these acronyms, I know this is going to start to be like a word salad as I continue here. PDM is person dependent models. PM is population models. SS are session splits. LSO is a leave session out. And LIO is leave an individual out. And what you'll see across all three um, machine learning models is they're at above chance and some are achieving up to 0.85 um, area under the curve. You can see from, so these are right, essentially different experiments that are being done because we're, we're configuring the data in different ways. What this is showing you is that population models in, in this data set were outperforming person dependent models. So as we got more data, we were able to have higher um, AUC when you train a model on everybody and leave one person out than having to do what you could argue is more laborious um, person dependent training. We also see relatively similar performance predicting individual classes of those behaviors versus combining them all together. This is interesting when we start thinking clinically about sort of specificity of what's the behavior and what might be the appropriate intervention. You see from um, this graph that there seems to be a dose response performance in terms of whether these behaviors are sort of mildly, moderately, or significantly intense. We use the acceleration data as a proxy for intensity. And where we're, we're missing where we have false positives, false negatives, is occurring more in the low and middle and not the high. So the high intensity, the ones that are really quite disruptive, we're, we're doing a better job of um, prediction than we were in the others, although I would argue that these are all still pretty good. Next, we were evaluating um, the area under the curve variation given some of the um, different properties of the data. So whether you are looking at a person uh, population model with session splits, um, whether you're doing person dependent, whether your data, if we have more sessions, less sessions, if they're of longer duration, shorter duration, the frequency of those behaviors, there is some interaction between certain models and certain properties of the data that I think we'll continue to explore explore further. It might not be just one model that is always the best model. Different models are performing differentially depending on properties of the data. This um, is meaningful in the sense that going forward, we may, you know, the holy grail is a one size fits all and it works well for everybody. But I'm not sure given the heterogeneity and autism that will achieve that. Having a, a family of models that we can deploy um, in, in a smart way, in a policy oriented way um, may help us achieve the best result we can for all individuals. Um, for the longest prediction time into the future in our data set, this ended up being 180 seconds or three minutes. The best performing classifiers uh, are what are plotted here. So three minutes into the future, the neural nets were giving us 0.78 AUC, logistic regression 0.80, and uh, SVMs at 0.85. So this is, three minutes prior to the onset of the event, we have a AUC that is sort of hovering around 0.80. We also looked across individual sessions and grouped them over time. So what we're looking at here is essentially test retest reliability or stability of the classifiers over time within individuals. And generally speaking, we're at about 0.80. So we're not having to do significant retraining of the classifier over time. It's performing consistently well over time. And then finally, we um, started some early work using domain adaptation techniques to see if we could um, take population models, start to feed them a little bit of data from an individual and see if this is, increases any of our um, uh, AUC. 
and so what you see on the left is one minute prediction. What you see on the right is the three minute prediction. In a one minute prediction using domain adaptation, we had a, a average increase of 14.48 in the AUC. And for the three minute in prediction window, um, we had an average increase of 6.3. So the domain adaptation is enabling us to get even higher rates of AUC than if we were just training on the um, population model. So there's work that is um, continuing now and that we're going to extend going forward, um, I think kind of in three primary ways. One is um, to continue to work with transfer learning and domain adaptation to see if we can individualize models using um, wholly or, or partially labeled data, right? Again, the holy grail is think of Alexa, right? You don't have to do reading known passages, drag and dictation for it to understand different age, different sex, different um, um, manners of speech or accent. It understands us all equally as well. It's got a huge data set to build from. It can find you in that data set. It would be nice if we could do something similarly and you don't have to ask families to undergo a, a, a very laborious training process to get a benefit um, right away. We're also looking at hierarchical Markov modulated point process models to see if we can account for some of the non-stationarity in our signals, generate maybe some handcrafted features that give us even more um, sensitivity and specificity uh, in those predictions. We have a current uh, NIH award with the autism, uh, the Marcus Autism Center at Emory University. These are, this is an outpatient setting, not inpatient. And they do functional analysis of behavior. So they will elicit these behaviors by changing environmental conditions to determine whether they're socially mediated behaviors. They're, they're an attempt of the individual to get another person to behave in a way that they would like or whether they're automatically maintained. So they'll enrich the environment with sensory information, they'll impoverish it, they'll place a demand, they'll give a preferred item, there'll be people in the room, they'll be alone. If they can see that there are clear frequency, duration, intensity differences by those different events, they can make an inference about what do we call a motivating operation or what is the reinforcing property of that behavior that has different intervention implications depending on whether it's socially mediated or it's automatically maintained if we can build that knowledge into the models um, we may be able to do a better job of predicting when these behaviors are going to occur but also what do you tell someone to do once um, that behavior uh, you're preparing for that behavior or its beginning we have also built, this is going on to the right now, um, a software infrastructure that lets us stream the data from the biosensor to the phone in real time, um, timestamp it with the behavior observation, push both sources of data to the cloud, run our classifiers in real time, and then push a notification back to um, the person who's got the phone in that environment. And would like to see this now basically um, used as a real-time notification system where we could couple with behavior management plans by a supervised clinician to deploy just-in-time adaptive interventions. So the idea is if we could take the unpredictability of the behavior away, what would the clinical benefits to family and clinical staff be if you knew you had three minutes, right? You have to remember that staff, faculty, clinicians, parents right now don't know often whether there's a problem until it's already occurred. They're in a response mode. They're, that's crisis management. And off, it's not a learning opportunity for, for anybody. If they could get early notification and they could stop what they're doing, make sure they have their eyes on the child, they could cue them to take a deep breath and relax. They could engage in, in um, soothing sensory um, give them a preferred tat. I mean, you can think of a number of things that might de-escalate de that individual so that the, the distress doesn't lead to aggression. Um, even if you can't prevent it, that would be the holy grip. But even if you can't prevent it, could you be prepared and, and keep yourself and that person more safe, so kind of mitigate that behavior? Um, and, and hopefully, if you're not so caught off guard, you might learn something about wh where was the person, what was going on that might have occasioned this event, and, and how do you prevent that from happening in the future? 
These are also by nature of the recording data collection systems. So knowing something, I've, everything I've been talking about has been in immediate environment. But if we know about their previous night's sleep, if we know about um, maybe seizure activity, if we know about medication changes, if we know about gastrointestinal status, these are all things where we have higher rates of comorbidity in autism that might be functionally related to mood and irritability that may reduce coping thresholds, that may increase stress responses that turn into fight or flight responses. There are things much further up chain, uh, upstream that we're not considering in the moment. And those are the core areas that probably also require intervention. What we're seeing is downstream off, I mean, physiology is changing before behavior, but something's changing prior to the physiological threshold. Um, there's also really kind of interesting and neat opportunities to think about, we're sending push notifications, right, through SMS. These are text messages. But if then that protocol, that could also be IoT, right? So think of a system that now when the classifier says there's a high likelihood that a behavior is going to occur, could Philips Hue's lights change? Could Alexa come on? Could imagery pop up onto your machine? Could doors automatically lock or unlock? Could um, individuals be um, pinged to come to the environment and to provide more support? We, uh, I'm pleased to say, I had this work recently published. Um, our first author is sitting in the back seat there, Talis, our own uh, research scientist uh, in EAI, and also I'm at. Um, Demarkaya and Ashtosin are both uh, master students in a College of Engineering, and Dennis or Dogmesh is a uh, faculty in College of Engineering and also a core faculty member of EAI. So collectively, uh, this was our team. This was published in JAMA Network Open. We um, came out on December 21st. I was just looking at this this morning. It's already had 5,500 views and close to 800 downloads. This tells me that we're not the only people who are interested in this topic. This is very rapid uptake. In fact, these alt metric scores, which I knew nothing about until we published this paper, they've tracked 25 million publications since they started, and this is in the 98th percentile of uptake. This is a good thing. This means that there are people out in the world who are interested in learning about this methodology, either to help autism or think about um, how this methodology more generally could be applied to other clinical conditions where aggression is a feature. In this publication, we also um, included a supplement that details every single step we took in pre-processing of the data, configuring our experiments, the full um, result pattern of every classifier and every experimental um, configuration we ran and their results. And then we have permission from families and from the Simons Foundation to upload the de-identified data set with the biosensor data and the behavioral annotations in Safari base. And now this will become publicly available to registered, um, well, to scientists who, who have IRB approval and register with Safari. So we're essentially going to crowdsource this data. And this is just the group that I want to talk to, uh, those of you online too. If you have interest in this area, um, even if you're not an autism person, but you're a physics person or a math person or a machine learning person or a signal processing person, we would love to learn what um, applying your expertise to this area and where you succeed and fail and where we succeed and fail. I think we can get to better solutions that get to families more quickly. So I want to thank um, the team here at Northeastern. I want to thank our colleagues at the Marcus Autism Center. And then funders of this project, the Nancy Larry Marks Family Foundation, the Simons Foundation, National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, National Cancer Institute, National Library of Medicine, National Science Foundation, and the Department of Defense. And the cheap plug, um, if you like what I'm saying, mm -hmm. if you share my enthusiasm to develop technology to advance public health, especially for those who are most vulnerable, we have a program for that here at Northeastern. That is joint between Bouvet. Um, and Great College of Computer Science. And with that, I think we can move to questions and answers. So are there questions from the audience? Yes, that is what I think. Great overview. Um, 
I'm interested in the sense that you said he used a commercially available set, which had lots of features. So if you could dream up your uh, improved sets, uh, I wouldn't want to go as far as ideas. So what are the weaknesses still and where would you have been to improve the sense? Thank you. Excellent question. So um, we're using I guess what I would say the best of what's available now in the sense that anybody can buy it. Um, it's shockproof and waterproof. So I know it's not going to break apart and somebody's going to swallow a piece. Um, you can access the raw data. So unlike an Apple watch or a Fitbit or a Garmin or, you know, some of the other um, consumer wearables, we're not reliant on their undisclosed pre-processing methods. Um, we can get right to the raw data. But it's limited in the sense that it requires wearability. You can take it off. The battery can die. If you're going to use this over long periods of time, when you're not always supervised, you know, we're in an inpatient setting. They're supervised 24-7. If they take it off, the staff go and put it back on. That's not going to be the case out in the real world. So I'm really interested in those who are working in um, electronics and material sciences smart band-aids, um, temporary electronic tattoos, other ways that we can get physiological signals that is not stigmatizing, that is, um, you know, longer battery life. Maybe we can harvest information, or sorry, harvest energy um, based on people's skin surface temperature or their, their movement, sort of like powering the device itself, and that you can't easily take it off. I would think that that would be a more scalable and durable solution going forward. There are also other measures, right? I mean, if we can get EEG, if we can get um, pupillary changes, the, the question is how do you obtain those measures in a unobtrusive, non-stigmatizing way? And you don't have so much noise in the data that the signal is just completely embedded. Yeah, that was my one follow-up and then another different question. The follow-up was, <laughs> testing, I get to have a sense of the noisiness or the artifacts that you might be able to remove and thereby increase your prediction quality. We are starting to look at, so when we did these models, um, it's looking at how, sig how features are changing over a sliding window. I think of this a little bit like a regime shift, right? The data is kind of of a general pattern, and then that pattern is changing. And the classifier is picking up essentially on variance. We have not looked yet, although we're currently starting to, at like visualizing all those biosignals and seeing what's shared and what's unique within an individual over time before, during, and after the behavior, or tried to, to do any kind of extraction of what might be a canonical waveform that might be. And we're, we're going to try to dig deeper in the biosensor data in part to see, really make the classifiers more transparent and less black box by doing more signal processing and kind of feature importance weighting. Question. So, quick question for is there something like a portal or some kind of like line for people like me who are not in the animal health and data information? Some of our companies may involve using some of like an equipment or device to collect some signal. But say, in one study, maybe we pay for a five day deployment, so that we may for battery, and another battery, we may need to be using the amount of hardware. This kind of stuff. Is there a DC tree or kind of like a consulting service to go ahead and say, oh, this would be the device that you would recognize to, to use for this purpose? Or I don't have any knowledge of anybody doing that. I haven't done that. It's an awesome idea. I can think of a few people within EAI and Northeastern more broadly who share our interests with complementary expertise, and we should do that. And you should be involved in the NLP sure. part of it. So I'm curious about, you said that the population, which is quite a lot, 70 people, 70 subjects, if I'm not yep. mistaken, yes. uh, were pre predominantly male. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you anticipate if it would be different, uh, whether there would be any meaningful differences? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I would have mad, 
I'm going to assume yes, and then we'll collect the data and we'll say if not, instead of assuming no and then not looking. Um, we were, you know, these are inpatient sites of general flow of behavioral health care. So we don't have any control over who's in that environment. And autism, I don't know, for those maybe I assumed more knowledge than I should, has a sex ratio of four to one. For every four males, only one female is currently um, being diagnosed. There is some question about whether that's true biology or those are um, sex skewed differences and how we assess and how we diagnose. I think in the current ongoing study in the outpatient setting, we're gonna have a more diverse population. And part of the reason that I selected Emory, there's very good people there and their functional analysis is great and their center does really good um, intervention. They also have a much more diverse catchment in Atlanta than you do in Providence, Portland, Pittsburgh, and Cincinnati. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to your question, but I think it's an important one, and I hope that we'll have a more diverse data set that I can help answer that. Thank you. Are there questions online? Yeah. Okay. Okay. The first one says, "Great work, Matthew. Have you thought yet about the ideal presentation of the notifications?" To Mm. Uh, think about it all the time, but we're um, continuing to do focus groups with families. And one of the problems, so they give us some ideas about what would be useful to them. You know, if it's a text notification, that's only so good as you've got your phone on you. Um, if you don't have your phone on you, you're not getting that help. So are there other things like ambient displays or sounds in the environment that you could customize to a, to a particular household? Um, I think we also need to eventually do a trial where we're deploying the real-time capability in a person's home over some period of time to learn what they understand and don't understand. Probability is a hard thing. Time's a hard thing. You have three minutes, but from when? And does that mean it's going to, like, what can I do within that three-minute period? Um, I'm not sure that we should be thinking that because we give a notification, somebody even knows exactly what to do. That might need to be paired with other guidance that the phone or your Alexa or your television is reminding you of what a supervising clinician suggests is a, is a good behavior management plan. And we won't really know that, I think, until we're deploying over some longer periods of time in those settings. Second question, I know it's hard to run large studies, but if you could afford to run a large study, would that improve your ability to predict onsets? Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> um, I would like to think so, but there's gonna be an upper limit to how much a change in physiology, I think is predictive of a behavior. If you get too far out in time, other things are intervening. We have to remember that the autonomic nervous system, um, we're using it as a, dependent variable, sorry, an independent variable to predict a dependent variable, which is the aggression. But your autonomic nervous system is also regulating your blood pressure. It's regulating your thermoregulation. Um, it's involved in your digestion. I mean, it's doing other things that may not be related to an event that is a, a behavioral um, disorganization. We have some limitation and that, even though that's a ton of data that we got, um, you know, many hours and many instances, we are somewhat bound by the frequency, intensity, duration, and the periods of time in between an offset and an, off and an onset. And in an inpatient setting, I mean, part of the reason why they're referred there is because it's very high rates. How this would function in a lower base rate right, with long periods of time without engaging in that behavior, and then boom, a big intensive one, and then short again. I don't know if it would perform as well as it does when it has high rate of behavior to train and, and test on. And I have to think there's an upper limit to how far out in the future. I mean, the general heuristic I would have is probably the more data you've acquired from the past, the longer you may be able to go out into the future, but your, um, accuracy, your your rate of true positives, true negatives, is probably going to diminish the further out you go. I think that that might actually be a good HCI 
kind of focus, which is let the you give the user an interface where they can tune how certain do you do you want the classifier to be and how much time, and there'll be some trade off there. Okay. You got any questions for the room? What else do you use to set? Here, here, just the mic. What else do you use to set the hover to train the model? So there's blood volume, pulse, electrodermal activity, uh, accelerometry, skin surface temperature. And then time since the last event from the phone annotation provided by the clinician. That's our future space. And we've done some preliminary analysis. I think we could probably do some more where you start to knock out features. What effect does that have on the classifier? And the one thing I wanted to know really quickly was is there unique variance explained in the outcome from the physiological data? If, if it's not giving you more than an accelerometer, then it's easier just to wear a pedometer than it is to have something that requires appropriate wear and contact and, and physiology. Or just knowing that the behavior already happened tells you that there's an increased chance that it's going to happen again. I do think part of that is there because of kind of the behavioral momentum of it. Um, but the, the physiological data is contributing unique variance. If we put all the data in versus only some of those features, we do better than if we impoverish the feature set. Thanks. I think you should talk more. Um, anyway, um, I have a question. What's the best performing ML that you have right now, and what are the challenges? So, I know you mentioned we, some of them already. If we look across kind of as a pattern of results with all of the different experiments and features and train and test, the logistic regression was performing the best. <laughs> the simplest one. <laughs> which is nice because it's easier to interpret. Whether it's truly a linear phenomenon, I don't know because as we get more data, like that's a, we have a lot of data, but it's not a lot of data for an SVM or a CNN. If we get more, more instances within a person, more individuals with more diverse ways of performing the behavior and just a larger corpus, these other classifiers may do as well or outperform. How large is it now? Um, 500 hours worth of labeled biosensor data over 70 people. But 70 people, I mean, I yeah. had ourselves all on the back. That's a, that's a lot. This was a big undertaking. And but if there are 17 million in the world, 70 is not a very representative or sizable sample for the number of people engaged in the behavior. Thanks. Um, are there more questions? Um, I know Dagmar is like, <laughs> <"Hard> <laughs> okay. Here comes a hard one. So, right. so I assume that the data that you collected um, is where the aggressive events we're not intervened. They were intervened. They were. Yes. Because, I mean, I would be interested in the nature of the follow of the following. Yes. Calling outbursts or events. Yes. Because you have the data. Right. And then that is a whole question in itself. Yeah. To analyze this, and you showed that with um, more intense, higher acceleration data, your prediction is is better. So can you sort of backtrack? to then identify the particular signals that are, let's say, indicative of the severity right. of the onset. Right. Or the I, we haven't done it, but I think it's a really nice question. I've also um, really was only talking about onsets, but we also have data on the offsets. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is of equal clinical interest to know once a behavior has begun, when is it likely to end for the intervention purposes. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not time to withdraw the intervention because even though they seem calm, the some features in the data may suggest that this is going to recur, and that is the kind of stuff that very much I think can demoralize caregivers and and clinicians. Is I did this intervention, they seem calm, and now they're doing it again. Well, maybe it's that we're thinking of discrete instances, and these are really bouts, and if we could predict sort of onset and then. So that you could deploy an intervention, but don't withdraw the intervention until you have kind of regained what you know won't be another instant right away. Um, 
was a little tricky about the inpatient setting is we, we can't take videos in that setting. So there's a lot of information about like, what were, how did people re react that we don't have coded because they have to react and we can't just summarize that for them um, off, offline. We have more questions from online. Okay. Um, was there resistance to the risk sensors by patients? Mm, that's another good question. Mm -hmm. um, I think we had 86 families consent. So 16, we didn't end up getting biosensor data from. Um, eight of those were discharged before an observation could be made. And eight of those could not tolerate wearing the sensor. So we had some, but um, not as much as I would have initially thought. They're also all trained. You know, they, they desensitize, they give them rewards. They have social stories. They, they're, they're kind of, we don't just slap it on somebody and say you can't take it off. Um, there, these are experts in in training this population on, on uh, new procedures. Okay, awesome, wonderful example of consumer use of AI. To what extent are caregivers slash parents involved in co-design of research and solution, including going forward? Thank you. Um, I'd like to say that's been a definition of my career in the field of autism is working with families and and clinicians to understand sort of what are their pain points that is research is not attending to. So I, I value this very much. Um, ultimately, this system may be used in some unsupervised way. So I'm also thinking a little, I know this is not exactly the question, but I think it's relevant. We have to be really careful about understanding what people understand when they receive these notifications. It's not 100% accurate, right? I mean, 0 0.80, we pat ourselves on the back. That's really good. But that means crudely 20% of the time we have a false negative or a false positive. I don't want people to think that because the classifier says, I don't think something's going to happen means that it isn't and you don't have to have your eyes on your kid and be responsible. At the same time, I don't want it firing all the time and nothing's happening. And then it's like Peter and the wolf. So th this is very much gonna have to be a collaboration between the people designing the system and the people who are using the system. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more. Okay, great. Can you ask? Thanks for the thoughtful space. So I'm kind of curious, like, have you looked at the, any component you have that are in the vehicle? Or, you know, if there is, because the data is used, maybe there is a pattern how they spread or, um, or the pattern, how they can interpret. Yeah, good question. Um, we've done a little bit, but not as much as could be done. So we did have published a paper that was just looking at the behavioral annotation, so none of the biosensor data, and was looking at essentially time course and recurrence quantization. So does emotion dysregulation precede, so can a staff observe that the child is having a tantrum before they start aggressing to another person or themselves? Or does the emotion dysregulation come after? Or does a self-injurious behavior precede an aggressive behavior or vice versa? And we do find some differences there. We have not yet looked at any of the biosensor features to see if they're predictive of those different time course events. That would be something that I would be interested in and hope that when we release the data that somebody will download and be interested in, in working on that together. Let's thank the speaker again. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you. We have two more announcements. And I would say, too, is that this is the best way to give a presentation. Leave a lot of room for discussion and questions. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Um, so some announcements, um, um, upcoming talks. So there is a talk by Gina Matthews on March 27th. So another distinguished lecture seminar coming up. Um, also, I want to also announce, um, not on the slide, but there is an autism teaming event, an AI plus health teaming event for a EAI faculty and um, researchers on Friday next week on March 22. So again, this is a, a good intro. There's a lot of problems to solve. 
for 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 teaming among our among our members of our institute. Okay, another another talk is um, on our another upcoming distinguished lecture seminar is by Steve Chen on um, April one, and again, uh, check out our website and and register. Thank you. <laughs>